morning, everyone. We're gonna keep letting people in here. We'll get started real quick. We lose Brady. Oh, there you are, Brady. <laughs> I, I lost you for a little bit. Good morning, everyone. A good group here, 31 already. We'll get started here in a couple minutes. Well, it seems to be slowing down. Maybe, Brady, do you want to start off with a, our welcome? Sure, I can do that. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the January 2023 Capital Chat. Uh, my name is Brady Werger. I am the chair of Iowa Developmental Disabilities Council, and we are glad to have you all here with us today. Um, I do want to apologize. Uh, we weren't able to provide a interpreter to attend this today. Um, so if you need to follow along and can't hear, please feel free uh, to uh, follow us with the closed captionings. And we hope the next time we meet that we can provide that interpreter for you. Um, we have several different things for discussion today, a lot of different topics. Um, so um, after we talk about that, we would love to hear from everybody to see what their thoughts and opinions are. Uh, remember, if you don't voice what you feel, um, you know, the whole point of these meetings are to um, educate people on what's going on here and and advocate to make change. So um, just encourage people to speak up so we can make that change. So Brooke, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Brady. And I think I'm handing it over to Carlin. Thanks, Brooke. And thanks, Brady. Uh, my name is Carlin Crow, and I'm the public policy manager for the DD Council. Um, new to this position and very excited about being part of our first capital chat of 2023. And I want to start off with getting giving um, right off the bat a shout out to Brady for the work that he does as the chair of the council and for being an awesome advocate and um, putting all of his a lot of his time and a lot of energy um, into our work here. So thank you, Brady, for all that you do and for doing our welcome today. Um, we have a full agenda today and um, the experts are actually coming up after me, but we thought we would first remind you about um, first the capital chats, which are monthly um, the fourth Friday of every month. Um, at 11 a.m., um, especially hot topics going on during the session, and then um, following session, uh, other things that we need to be doing year-round as advocates. So there's always something going on that needs our attention. Um, and uh, we will talk about other resources that we have available, too, um, later on in our conversation. Um, but first, we wanted to talk about uh, the DD Council's agenda for 2023. And if you haven't seen this yet, um, those of you who have, this is a reminder. Um, but if you haven't, we have um, three focus areas for the year um, for our policy agenda. Um, many of them are uh, similar to what we had on our agenda last year with some refinements. And uh, to start off, uh, we definitely still wanna focus on the workforce um, shortage as it relates to 
direct service professionals and um, advocate that we fully fund um, healthcare services and community-based supports um, that can help uh, help this workforce crisis um, in both urban and rural areas. Um, number two is to support an inclusive and accessible community for all Iowans. And this may sound um, kind of broad and uh, it's meant to be a little bit, but this um, particular focus area would cover things like um, the adult changing tables that were a big focus um, last session. And also one of the topics that we have been talking about this year, um, which we will probably regaining or gathering information this year and seeing if there's um, something that we might be able to work on um, in coming years are issues that surround transportation. As we know, this is a, uh, transportation is a challenge and a barrier um, for many people who need to get to work or to get to activities um, and sometimes especially in rural areas. So um, we, will, we are gathering and doing some research on that. So if you have information that you'd like to share with us or a story, um, please let us know. And um, third and, and last but not least, uh, um, obviously is to um, reduce the or re remove, we would like to remove the waiting list for home and community-based services. Um, and this is a little bit uh, challenging right now because um, we know that the state is taking a good hard look at um, Medicaid waivers and um, based on information that they gathered and surveys um, trying to come up with a plan um, for waivers moving into the future. So um, our agenda is a right now a monitoring um, agenda where we have not introduced specific um, recommendations. Um, and right now we know that we are in line with many other um, disability related organizations who have um, the same issues at the top of their agenda. So there are many people who are um, wanting to work on these issues. And um, Amy's gonna tell us a little bit more about how these might um, be coming up, or if they will be, and um, what we are working on in the meantime. Um, and I think before Amy comes on, yes, we just wanna remind you about the resources that we um, have available um, both live and on our website. So the snapshots um, are weekly videos that um, Amy and I, and hopefully some um, guest uh, presenters and speakers will be coming up. Um, we um, shoot them every Friday and then they're posted on Monday. So it's kind of a recap of what happened for the week um, at the Capitol. And um, Amy always makes them entertaining. So if you, you want to join just for that reason. Um, then we have these monthly chats. Um, the, we'll talk a little bit later about the Bill Tracker and the Take Action Center. Um, public forum calendar so you can um, attend forums in your local um, community. Um, our legislative guide just um, came out in hard copy. I'll show you what that looks like. It's really nice. Um, it's also online. And it's very helpful to um, see who your legislators are and who the um, leadership is of our House of Representatives and Senate and um, um, exec executive branch leadership also. So uh, great resource there. And we have our advocacy toolkit online. And also um, we have five groups who will be um, getting grants to come to the Capitol um, this legislative session and um, do an advocacy day. So we're happy to support other um, organizations who um, can come from across the state and um, advocate um, for our issues and also their priorities. So um, we will touch on these a little bit later, but moving on to, I wanna introduce Amy Campbell, um, our I think we call her our eyes and ears and feet on the ground and everything else at the Capitol and, and true expert on um, what's happening. So Amy, take it away. Thanks. Well, um, it's been a busy three weeks um, as Car Carlin can attest. Um, 
we've both been trying to cover all of the subcommittees and committees that are happening. Um, this year is a little different because they've identified three different time periods, like an hour block each that subcommittees can meet, which basically means there's like 800 subcommittees at the same time. So Carlin and I coordinate to make sure that we have as much coverage as we can. I do wanna remind people that you can watch those subcommittees um, online um, at the legislative website. And um, maybe somebody can put in the link in the chat, the legislative website. But if you go to the House and Senate um, calendars, they'll have a full list and you can and kind of just jump in and watch any of them. Um, you can watch committees. Um, but I always think it's nice to to watch how other advocates talk about an issue in a subcommittee meeting, because it kind of gives you an idea how people communicate their um, their concerns or their support for a bill. Um, in the Senate, you can actually participate from your computer. Um, all you need is a Zoom account. It can be a free Zoom account, but they make you have a Zoom account because um, they've had some people do some bad things on the Zoom, so they need to make sure it's a real person and not some bot doing bad things. Um, so um, you do have to sign up for one, but they're free. As long as you have an email, um, you can do that. And so um, I did want to, we wanted to highlight a few things that happened at the Capitol this week. Um, you know, if you've been reading the newspaper, watching the news, it's um the first two weeks were all about the governor's education reform bill. So that House File 68 um, uh, passed in, on Monday, both chambers, and was signed by the governor on Tuesday. So that allows, people call it a lot of different things. They call them vouchers. They call them scholarships. their educational savings accounts. The governor called it her students first. All of it is the same thing that allows the money that would have gone to public school for a student, the state um, dollars that would have gone, um, would be able to be used in a private school. So they there's $107 million that they expect to spend for a little over 14,000 students. Um, it is what they call a standing unlimited appropriation, which means that number, if there's a lot more students, they could they have to spend the amount of money that they have to fully fund it. So um, if 20,000 students um, want to do it, then they'd have to pay for that. Um, so obviously that $107 million is just a prediction of how many might actually ask for these dollars. And that might be based on how many kids are already in private schools. Um, the DD Council did testify Carlin and, and Brooks submitted comments of concern about what that means for special education in those schools in public schools if they'll have enough resources. Um, Disability Rights Iowa had actually submitted some really good stats that showed um, that there's a, high, a much higher concentration of individuals that have um, the IEPs, the individual education plans in um, public schools, only 2% in private schools, and it's over 20% in public schools. And they were worried that that means there'll just be a higher concentration of kids needing special education in um, public schools if more and more kids leave um, for private schools. So um, there, the, yeah, I think if you go online, you can still read all the comments on House File 68 that people submitted. Um, Kind of moving into positive stuff, um, there are some really good bills that have been passed and one kind of a stinker, I'll just say. Um, Post-secondary transitional grants, that's a long word for saying they're basically um, like scholarships for individuals, um, 18 individuals with disabilities um, that are young adults, like 18 to 21 or 23, I can't remember, Carlin. Um, but House File 16 allows uh, put some money into a tuition program to help people pay for programs like the University of Iowa's REACH program and Northwestern's um, NEXT program, Northwestern College up in um, now Orange City, Sioux Center, up, up in the Northwest Iowa. 
So REACH is a four-year program, NEXT is a two-year program, and the tuition is pretty high. It's over $30,000 at University of Iowa, so, and that doesn't include room and board. So these, this um, tuition program could really help offset some of those costs for families that want to send their kids there. Um, and that is done by Representative Ingalls. It passed out a subcommittee this week, and Carlin, whose son is in the program, was able to talk about it both from the DD Council perspective and as the parent perspective. So that was very helpful. And um, Representative Ingalls, who is from Randalia up in Northeast Iowa, he his, his daughter went through the program. So he also is a big advocate for that. Um, and I, when I get out through all of these, we'll just pause and see if people have questions. But um, the another bill that had a subcommittee this week, and I think it passed out. Um, I wasn't able to go to this one, but it removed the annual caps on the in intellectual disabilities home and community based services waiver on um, vehicle and home modifications. So House Cell 74 um, aligns the ID waiver um, with the BI brain injury waiver um, in terms of the home and vehicle modification caps. So right now, Intellectual Disabilities Waiver has, uh, you can see, uh, about $5,700 lifetime cap. So throughout the person's lifetime, they can only um, use a benefit of $5,700 to modify your home and vehicle, which, you know, if you're on <laughs> that, your, your car is not going to last 20 years. Um, let's just say that. Um, so uh, they want, this bill would change that so that it would be the same as the brain injury waiver, which is an annual cap of a little over $6,800. Um, so you would have that annually available. I'm guessing there will be some kind of um, estimate on how much this is gonna cost the state. Um, we also wonder if the Department of Health and Human Services who is doing a waiver review right now to look at all of the waivers and how to make that uh, more streamlined and meet the needs of people rather than being based on their diagnosis. Um, we wonder if they'll think this is premature to do this before that report is out. So uh, for now it's moving forward and we'll see um, how much further it can, it can move. I'm going to skip this one um, on public assistance because that's the stinker and I will move on and then come back to that. But um, there is another bill that adds a new waiver, um, the Home and Community Based Services Autism Waiver. So it would require the HHS to go and apply for this waiver. I again think maybe they will say this is premature based on our review of the waivers right now, but um, it has not had a subcommittee meeting yet. Um, there's also a bill that was introduced by a Democrat, so it's probably doesn't have a whole lot of chance to pass, but it's a good bill that we wanted to highlight, House File 130, um, and that, you recall, uh, we the, over the past couple of years, there have been some voting changes, and one of those was moving our early voting period, so when you can mail in your ballots and when you can go in in person to vote early, um, to 20 days, which has been very challenging for county auditors to mail out the ballots and get them back before the cutoff, which is election day. So um, this, this bill returns our early voting period to 40 days, which is what it was before. Um, and before it was even longer, it's just um, uh, that was the, the the, the first change was to move it to 40 days and then it moved it to 20 days. So um, I think the bill drafter felt the 40 days was a good compromise. But again, it's by Representative Levin in um, Iowa City and being a new legislator and a minority party legislator probably means they won't bring the bill up for discussion, but that doesn't mean you can't advocate for it. Um, it's certainly people that want that to happen should advocate for it. And then, so I wanted to save this one for last because it's it's a really big bill. So this is um, the Public Assistance Integrity Bill is what they're calling it, House File 3. We had a subcommittee yesterday on it. They only allowed for 30 minutes of comment. So I didn't get to speak, Carlin didn't get to speak. Um, and, uh, but there were two individuals with disabilities that did 
speak very eloquently about this bill and very passionately. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, this bill is a monster. It has a whole bunch of stuff in there and it's all intended to make sure that people who are don't, don't um, qualify for public assistance. So food assistance, um, the SNAP program is what that's called um, and Medicaid and the family investment program. So um, anything that's like a cash benefit or a benefit from the state, they um, want to do a bunch of different tests and they want to do a series of them four times a year. They want to test all assets. So if you own more than one car, your second car would count as your assets. Um, they want to know if you own uh, what you own and add that to what um, your assets are. And basically, if they're over a certain level, then you can't don't qualify. And so they want to do that for all public assistance programs. And they also want to start adding what they call community engagement. Um, some people just call it work requirements. They call it community engagement because they also allow somebody to either work, go to school, or be in a training program, or um, or um, volunteer for 20 hours a week to qualify. And then there's some things that would exempt you, um, like if you're caring for a child with a disability. Um, however, it only says child, not an adult. So if you're caring for your adult child with a disability, um, and you're not being paid for that, um, you that wouldn't qualify as an exemption to work. You'd still have to work. It, it also, if you're caring for uh, like a parent that has Alzheimer's or a dementia, that wouldn't count. So I know they heard a lot of comments about different things that would qualify for work exemptions. They also have a piece in there that requires anybody getting food assistance to work, and there are no exemptions. There's not, they don't allow any waiver of that. Um, so I think that is a bit concerning for people too, especially with all the food insecurity right now and how much, you know, um, all food costs. We've all seen it in our grocery bills. So there are a lot of groups opposed to this bill, including the Iowa DD Council, um, Easter Seals. Um, there are a lot of partner groups that are also opposed to this. Um, there is going to be, they moved it out of subcommittee. There's going to be a large amendment and there, the subcommittee members are still asking for input on that. So I would encourage you to talk to your legislators about your concerns with that too. And, and I, I can put in um, later in the chat um, who the, the subcommittee members are. Um, it's, it's Representative Jennery, Tom Jennery, Representative Ann Meyer, and Representative Beth wessel Crochelle, and they're actively seeking comments on that bill and changes that they can make to make it better. Um, the last thing I'll say about it is I ha we have not heard from the department yet, but the Department right, of Health and Human Services right now participates in a national ask, uh, uh, verification program. So, and it's free. Other states use it too. And they check national databases to make sure somebody still qualifies for Medicaid or, or food assistance. Um, and they check that and it's free to the state. But this bill would say, you have to not do that anymore. You're going to stop doing that. And you're going to pay another company to do the same thing. So that is a, probably one of the biggest inefficiencies of this of this particular bill, not to mention you're going to trust that all of those national databases and state databases are correct, which we know they're not. Like um, I've heard the corrections database is very outdated. So um, there's just a lot of concern about this on top of everything else that's going on with adding an MCO and the unwinding, those two things we'll talk about later um, of, the, of the public health emergency, which is gonna have a lot of people coming off of Medicaid um, that the state wasn't allowed to bring off before. So um, it's just a lot all at once. I don't know 
Um, this, all of this bill would require the state to ask permission to do it um, from the federal government. And I think there's a lot of people that think the federal government will not allow that. So um, it, it might be, a, it might be more messaging than it is actual policy, but um, I think it's still pretty concerning to a lot of people. So I will stop there for questions. Or if there's something on that I don't have on this list that you want to talk about, um, go for it. Amy, we do have a question from Jan. Um, so elderly people, people that are considered disabled or 100% unemployable through Veterans Affairs on SNAP would be required to work according to the way the bill stands now. Yes. <laughs> yep. It's there. There were the room was packed, and very few people got to speak because they only had thirty minutes. So, uh, and this is Tammy Amsbaugh, and I just wanted to say about that. Just think about at the same time you're doing asset and eligibility tests, and you're requiring work to earn money. You're you're like sending a conflicting message. And I don't know if that will come out very well in um, this discussion, but um, anyway, just wanted to like point that out. Yeah, I think you're getting to the crux of what they wanna, they want you to work more so you don't qualify, so they don't have to pay for it. <laughs> but we all know there's a point where like, if you can't find childcare and you work as a CNA, yeah, all oh. of your money is going to be going to childcare if you have three kids and it's not going to, the money is not going to make it, it's not going to equalize out. Now, I think they do say, well, you can volunteer then you could go work at a nonprofit for that amount of time. But the only exemption you have from work is if you have one child, uh, have a child under one. If you have children that are two, three, and four, but aren't in full-time school, that's still, you're going to have to find daycare for all three of them. So it is, it really, it's your, I mean, that's a calculation I know. My husband's a stay-at-home dad, and we made that calculation with our three kids. He would be, basically, we would, we would have, he'd be working to pay for the child care. So he, he decided to stay home to provide that child care. So, I mean, that that's the calculation people are going to be making. Well, and, and you can't, you have to find the daycare to volunteer too. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's a lot of interactions in that, that I, that would be interesting to try to point out as they consider that, because it might make sense to somebody because we have a workforce shortage that we want everybody to work or, you know, I mean, I'm just, just how those interactions are in place for people aren't always the first thing you see in that come in that discussion. Yeah. And there's probably a lot of them. Yes. That I can't even think of right now. I mean, you talk to legislators about red tape, bureaucracy, um, you know, all of the things that providers have to do. I mean, providers are going to have to help some of the folks they care, they provide services to, to be able to keep the person on, on their assistance. So, I mean, it's, it's just adding more work to people that already have way too much paperwork and, and all of that. And we all miss things in the mail when they come. And so uh, there's just a lot of concern that people are going to inadvertently get dropped off. And that's how the state saves money. That's why they're going to say it's going to save money. But last I had heard, I haven't seen a new fiscal note on it to anticipate how much it'll cost. But the last time I saw it was like hiring 46 people and $30 million cost to the state. And they still think they'll save money, which means $30 million won't be spent on services at least, if not more. So we're gonna watch this really closely. You're gonna probably see it in our weekly updates. Uh, um, 
you know, probably next week, if they bring this out of committee, we'll know more about what the final bill will look like because they're going to make some significant amendments. There were some provisions, the parts in there that I didn't talk about that they're taking out that would limit what you could buy with your food assistance to like, you can't buy sliced cheese, you can't buy white bread. Um, they're going to change it to just being you can't buy soda and candy. And this all came because somebody was shopping for their um, Christmas present and wanted to send an edible bouquet to um, a friend and was looking at the one that had candy bars in it. It was all candy bars looking like flowers and it said snap eligible. Which mean. And so that got somebody mad and that's why that was put in the bill. So they will make some changes and just say you can't buy sugar soda and candy. Um, I guess you can buy brownie mix, but not, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but so they're just, they're just making it harder to sweeten the pot. They added a million dollars in this bill to the double up food bucks program, which is a great program. It, it basically takes your snap dollar. And if you use it to buy fruits or vegetables, it will double the value. So you get an extra dollar on the dollar um, if, for buying those fruits and vegetables. Um, but I don't think it's sweet enough to make that bill pass with every, uh, make it uh, make other groups support that bill, I should say. And plus Amy on that, that was only going to be added if they got federal approval. Did you say that? So that yes. money goes away if they don't get federal approval. Well, right now it would still be in there. But if they were to change the, you would still get the double up food bucks, but, but they could write it in a way that it's only, only if they get the approval that they would provide the million dollars. I think it's how it's written now. I think it's written that, that it has to get approval the oh, way okay. that, yeah, I, cause I think somebody made a comment on that, that, you know, put that in there anyway, without okay. getting federal approval which of um, course that would be something we would support that piece there. Yeah. Okay. Amy, if I could add, I just wanted to um, mention, you know, the reason that we do these chats too is to go into detail on some of these bills that could have some very, um, you know, bad impacts on our community. And the, the House Bill 3 is um, obviously one of those bills, but the other, you know, part about, you know, what we're talking about here being an advocate is um, like understanding all the details. The, if you just, you know, read what's in the media about this bill, you'll hear it's the SNAP bill um, or, you know, what, what uh, was reported heavily was the food limitations that came out initially. Um, that are actually still in the bill, but this is, you know, they said they were going to amend that out. So, you know, pulling out particular um, food items that you cannot purchase on SNAP. But in the details of this bill, there are some very serious implications for people who are on Medi Medicaid or are going to apply for Medicaid um, with the asset verification. So this could have serious implications for um, people moving forward on Medicaid, but there's not very much known because there's not detail about what the asset limitations are, or, you know, they said that with Medicaid, um, the bill says that it will look at the household, everyone in the household's assets, um, not just the Medicaid applicant or the person on Medicaid, but it doesn't say what they're going to do with those assets. So, um, as Amy said, I mean, this bill is a mess. And, you know, if you, if probably if you read the media today, I mean, I read a news story yesterday that said something about, you know, food limitations bill removed. Well, the, the bill was not removed. It was just those very, you know, um, few requirements that were, you know, the highlight of the bill because it was so, uh, you know, something that we just couldn't imagine happening. And that's what the media picks up on. So um, that's why um, we have, you know, we're gonna be obviously monitoring this very closely, but also as Amy said, we're not even sure if um, this would pass um, with uh, 
you know, there's going to have to be um, authority to do this from the federal level. Um, and we're not even sure if that's going to happen. But in the meantime, this is one to focus on if you are contacting your legislator, um, because the effect on the disability community could be great. <clears throat> Yeah, I think you're really going to, you probably will start to see some action alerts coming out from us on this once we see what the bill actually is um, and what the committee is planning on doing with that. So stay tuned, but you can always find stuff on our bill tracker, the links down there. Um, we do uh, did make some improvements to the website this year. Um, some screen readers were having trouble with it. Um, so we were able to get that um, more uh, an accessible version. So if you have a screen reader that's having trouble reading it on the website, there's a button you can click to make it um, more accessible for screen reading. And we had our wonderful Mike Honig from over in um, Eastern Iowa. Used to be well, he's still at the U said um, kind of. <laughs> he were, retired and then came back. Um, um, take a look at it for us and um, verify that it was working okay. So, um, but that does, we add new bills every day. You'll be seeing bills added, um, you know, as we move forward in the session, um, but um, we add new ones every day. And then um, we also, um, it, it has an automatic update of the, of the status. So you can see votes on it, you can see where it's at in the process. Um, and I just wanna warn people that when you see House Study Bill or HSB or Senate Study Bill, SSB, those bill numbers will change. And sometimes House file and Senate file numbers change as they move forward. It's just a mess that they do that. But um, study bills always get a House file or Senate file number after they get out of committee. And then sometimes a committee will pass a bill and want to change who's the sponsor and make it the committee that's the sponsor. And that triggers a new bill number too. So it's it's a quirky thing. So don't, don't get hung up if a bill changes numbers or why it just happens. And, um, you know, sometimes it's for a real reason. Like if, if you have somebody that supports, that introduced a bill like the public assistance bill, House File 3, and maybe you take a bunch of stuff out of there and you only are left with the double up food bucks, um, the original sponsors might not like that. <laughs> so they, they'll they change the bill number to say it's a committee bill instead. So that's, that's kind of why that happens, but um, we will always have that in the bill tracker, the new number, but it will say in the description, um, successor to or form, or this bill was House File 3, just so you know, um, know that. Amy, we have one more question before we move on. Um, could this bill override the state's ability to disregard parental income when applying for an HCBS waiver? Don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that would also require obviously federal approval. Yeah, you'd have to get federal approval on that. And and when I say the state would have to get federal approval, the feds always have a comment period during that too. So people have an input into that decision-making. I, I don't know, and I will follow up on that. Who asked the question? Just to make sure. Paula Conley. Okay. And I think that's where, you know, we were talking about the, the language is vague when it talks about um, looking at assets. So, um, that's why I think uh, there's a lot of things that, a lot of unknowns here that we can't, not sure what the effects are. <laughs> yeah, because some, some things apply to the, only the health and wellness plan expansion people and others apply to all, but the asset tests apply to all. So that that's where it gets confusing. The work requirements are just health and wellness plan, but the asset tests are for everything. So that's a good, that's a very good question. And all, again, all of this is a state plan amendment that would have to be approved by the federal government. So I don't see that happening with this group, but with this Biden, with the Biden administration, but I, you never know. So um, I think that's a good question and we will, we will get the answer to that. 
Pammy also um, wanted to put a shout out for the Action Center, um, and she contacts her reps on that, but she wants to know what you, you suggest for contacting the committee members who may not be from her district. So I we have a quirk in the Action Center. I can't really, um, we haven't been able to, if you're not from that person's district, you can't really email them through the Action Center. So um, you kind of have to do that on your own, just email separately. But um, one thing I always suggest people do is when they do register or email their legislators to ask them to talk to their friends and colleagues on that committee. Because that's one thing you can ask a legislator to do is advocate on your behalf with their, their um, fellow legislators on those committees. Um, but they are, I would say in this subcommittee in particular, they have asked for anyone, not just members of their district, but anyone to submit comments. So they are asking for those comments. And I would just, whenever the one thing, I was just at a meeting with Representative Brian Losey last night, and he said, the number one thing not to do when you advocate is send a form letter. He's like, we just don't list, look at those. Now, that's all they do on the federal level. Congress based, the Congress staff, congressional staff just literally count how many pro and for and against contacts they get. So form letters are fine on the congressional level, but at the state level here, legislators hate form letters. So I always have that problem when I'm setting up something on the Act, Take Action Center. I have a little bit of a suggestion in the email, but we always ask people to change that and add your own personal story. Otherwise, they are not probably going to look at it very, very much if it's the same, if they get 20 of the exact same thing. So um, whatever you do, I think the important piece is to say how it's going to impact you um, and your the and the per people you know or people you serve depending on um see if i can move the there we go we already talked about the dates for the capital chats i just wanted to remind you of them and you can find that on the iowa dd council um website a couple of dates to kind of highlight february 10th is coming up um that is the bill request deadline um, so legislators that want to have a bill requested need to do that by February 10th. Um, and then bills need to get out of that. You know, the bills are assigned to a committee when they're introduced. So they're introduced and given a bill number, and then they're assigned to a committee. By March 3rd, those bills need to get out of that committee or they're dead for the year. So that's what the first major deadline is, is getting bills out of committees. So that's why you have a lot of subcommittee meetings. They got to go through subcommittee, then the committee um, and to beat that, that deadline on March 3rd. So you're going to see a lot of activity kind of stepping up in the next couple of weeks to get ready for that. Um, then um, the next deadline, they call them funnels, is they kind of winnow the they winnow the list of bills down every time. Um, but that second funnel is at the end of March, March 31st. So by then the bill has to have passed one, either the House or the Senate, and then gone through committee in the other side. So if it's a House bill, it has to get out of Senate committee. If it's a Senate bill, it has to be out of a House committee. So that all has to happen by then. And then budgets will probably start happening in March and um, really stepping up in April. So budget discussions don't usually happen until later in the session. And then they're gonna try to be done by April 28th. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> and just a reminder that, that again, as we mentioned that we do our monthly um, or our weekly reports by video or um, the written one. And those are on our website too. Um, you can find them if you didn't see it in your inbox. Um, there. And I'm going to turn it over. We, we didn't want to lose the opportunity to talk about what's going on with the Medicaid unwinding. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Brooke and Carlin on this. Yeah, so I mean, they even kind of use a confusing word by calling it unwinding. I'm, I'm not sure when they came up with that. Um, but basically, this is also what they're called continuous coverage. So during the last two and a half years, if people were on Medicaid, um, and for whatever reason, um, during that time became ineligible for Medicaid, meaning they wouldn't have met the eligibility standards, you weren't kicked off Medicaid, you weren't disenrolled in Medicaid during this time. Um, they were still doing eligibility determinations for Medicaid, but they were not kicking folks off of Medicaid. Um, with new federal law that came out at the end of 2022, that federal um, allowance is ending. Um, and this is going to start in April that, um, well, actually, I believe folks will start receiving the letters in, in March. And the uh, Health and Human Services has done two town hall meetings about this. And that website there is on the bottom of the slide. And those are record, recorded, <clears throat> excuse me, so you can listen to that and, and see the slides on that. Um, and I believe they might be doing one more. Um, and they're doing a lot of communication to try and get out this information for folks. But anybody on Medicaid, you will go through this redetermination process in the next 12 months. And so you do need to be on the lookout for your mail if you do get anything from Medicaid. Um, what we've learned during the town hall meetings is that they are starting or prioritizing with people that um, have not successfully past the Medicaid eligibility during the last 12 months. And so those folks will be getting the letters, we think, sooner than, than others that, that may continue to qualify for it. Um, because I think that they know that those are the folks that they are probably not going to remain eligible. And um, their eligibility then, their form should come out, their form should be back April 5th during this first um, go around. Um, if they're not eligible, then the way that I understand it, then for those groups that get this letter first, that may may first would be the first time that those folks would not be eligible for Medicaid. You're gonna make um, but just make sure that you're checking your mail. Um, we did also find out that uh, folks, um, there's another phase that people will go through this process where they'll just automatically determine people are eligible. They're still calling this redetermination, but they call it passive. Um, and so those folks, if, if you end up being in that pool of people, then you'll get a letter from Medicaid saying that your coverage is continuing. Um, so, so that's another scenario that could happen for some people that might be on the call. But bottom line, just continue to look for your um, look for mail um, for anything from Medicaid. If you have moved recently, um, be sure to contact a um, member provider services. And that's all on that website on how to do that and make sure that they have the most um, up to date uh, mailing address for you guys. And we'll continue to remind people to do this throughout the process as well, too. Thanks, Brooke. I know um, this is just a trying time because we also know that there's going to be a reassignment of people to MCOs as well when they're adding on a new one. And um, they're, they come on board July 1. So you're, you're seeing there's going to be an overlapping of a lot of things going on with um, Medicaid. So stay tuned, watch your mail, um, participate in those town hall meetings that Medicaid has, offers members um, so that you can can ask questions or stay informed too. And then of course that website will have information on it. Um, uh, Carlin, so the, I, I, Carlin's gonna talk about, uh, about our uh, new shout outs, but I do wanna uh, mention that this picture was taken at the public hearing on House File 3, the public assistance bill. And those two individuals um, on the far end of the table were um, people that self-identified as having a disability and gave some amazing speeches. I really wish I would have, you know, they only got two minutes, but they packed in a lot in that two minutes. And I wish I had recorded it because um, they were they were really great comments. Don't even, I didn't even take down their names, but um, they, they did a fantastic job. So Carlin, I'm gonna turn it over to you here. Thanks, Amy, and 
Um, yeah, we're going to shout out to those two um, young women today who were um, brave enough to come to the Capitol, um, come to a subcommittee meeting. This was not a public hearing. This was a subcommittee meeting. It's big. There was a lot of people there. They had to move or change the room um, kind of at the last minute so that because they knew we were going to have to accommodate a lot of people, um, you know, sit down at the table with these uh, three subcommittee members and um, get on a microphone and uh, tell their story about how this bill would affect them um, and you know what's going on in their lives. So I think they were the only two people who gave uh, kind of personal testimony who weren't there representing somebody else. Um, some of the other um, people who were there representing other people or lobbyists also gave some personal testimony, but they probably might have already been at the Capitol. Um, and there were many other people who came just um, for this meeting. And um, so we want to give them a shout out. And I even talked to one of them right afterwards, and I didn't get her name either. Um, so we're going to, we're, this is what we're doing um, this year is we want to do more recognition of those of you who are. Um, advocating and what your how your advocacy is going. Um, we want to hear from you and we want to hear success stories. Um, we want to hear any story um, about how you have contacted your policymakers, whether at the state level, local level, um, people that you know are able to make change, you're able to make change, they're the ones that can change the policy. So um, we want to hear your stories you know, or somebody that you know, if you know that somebody is um, um, keeping in good contact with their legislator and telling their stories and making an impact, please let us know because uh, we want to not only give them shout outs, but we want to set all of you up as an example so that you all know what everybody else is doing. It's kind of helpful to know, you know, hear what's, what is successful for people. If you're getting through to your legislator through email or through, um, you know, some uh, legislators give out their phone numbers and you can text them. Um, and that's sometimes they like that. So if that works for you, let us know because we want to know what's working for you and so that we can share it with our community and all of our advocates um, so that we can all be successful. So, so that's our new shout out um, segment <laughs> that we'll do here and also on our weekly um, capital snapshots. Um, so share your stories. And we want to also try and end our sessions with um, how you can take action. And so I appreciate um, those of you who asked on here, Tammy, especially, you know, if I'm going to contact somebody, what can I say? And we want to be here to help you with that um, also. So as you think about these take action steps, if you have questions or if you need some verbiage or want to know how to say things, please feel, out, feel free to reach out to me. Um, or um, or even Amy or Brooke, and we can get back to you. Um, we might not have the answer right away, but we can get the answers if it's something specific about a bill like Paula had. Um, we will certainly um, find the answers if we can get them. So for this month though, here's some action items that we wanna suggest. Um, check out the InfoNet section of our website. I know some of you are already doing that here today. Um, the Bill Tracker and the Take Action Center are really um, fabulous at ways to uh, see what see what bills we're tracking or following. Um, and you can click right on them, read the bill, um, go right to the legislative legislative website, which will show um, where the bill is going, if the number has changed, who's on the subcommittee, who's on the committee, if it passed. Um, so it's a, it's a way to um, get to the legislative website very quickly, but also shows you what we're monitoring and what's happened with it, what's happening with things. Um, and then the Take Action Center is where you can contact your legislators. So um, they're great resources and we hope you will um, take advantage of them and share them with your friends and family. Um, <clears throat> also about House File 3. Um, as Tammy asked about, you know, maybe what can you say if it's um, not your, your um, um, specific legislator? Um, I think at this point, you know, we want to make sure that they're aware that this bill could have very serious consequences for um, people with disabilities in Iowa. 
So um, we want to just at this point say, you know, we're looking at ways that um, Medicaid can help people um, during uh, with their health care and provide the services that they need to be, you know, functioning members of um, their community and and stay in the community that they want to stay in um, and get those services and um, health care services that they may need. So, you know, the way this bill looks is that that's going to make that more difficult. And so we're looking for solutions, um, not ways that we were going, are going to reduce services for the people who need them. So at this point, um, because we know the bill is going to be in transition, um, we just want to make them aware that we have concerns about uh, the effect um, on people with disabilities. And um, there are many others who do too. So it's not like this is um, a hidden bill. This is very much um, on the forefront and they'll, they should know what you're talking about. And, um, you know, feel free to tell your story or, you know, your general concerns um, about the bill. And another way that you can express those uh, concerns is to attend a local forum. So usually on Saturday mornings, um, a lot of uh, communities will have whatever legislators are serving their area, um, have a public forum where you can go and, um, and make comment there. And they'll talk about what their priorities are and what they're working on. Um, and you can come and talk about yours too. So it's a great way to connect locally and get your face in front of them and have them hear your name and get to know you better and you can get to know them better too. So um, there is a list of those on, is it on our site right now? I missed that one. Yes, yeah, so I was just, I, I was going to share the screen here to try to show you where they're at on the website. So if you go to our website, the Iowa DD Council, are you seeing my screen, my desktop? Yeah. Yes. Okay, if you go to the Iowa DD Council, it's on the front page down at the bottom, down here, um, the calendar. So you can just click on one and it'll tell you who's there and where they're at. It doesn't look like that one has an address, but every week I'm sending out, um, this one has the address. Um, there, was, there's a, there was a little quirk with some of our stuff that the address didn't happen, but you can find all, all of the information on that, or you can go up to our calendar that way and you get a full screen of it. Um, and also I've been sending out like a spreadsheet of them every week with my Monday um, this week at the Capitals. So you'll have the option to either link back to this page or get, um, you can click on it and get a two week spreadsheet of um, all of them as well. So, um, but yeah, some of them you might have to hit show all because there's a lot of them on, on Saturdays, as you can see that week has a whole bunch, but, but yeah, it always should be at the, at, on the front page and you just have to kind of scroll down all the way to the bottom to see it. I go Thank to every one of mine. Who said that? That would have been Todd. I go there and they know it to expect me there when I get there. That's great, Todd. Awesome, Todd. See, shout out to you. That's a perfect shout out example. <laughs> Thank you for letting us know. Yes, you got to yes. speak up. And of course, we, you know, also um, have some tips that we that are in our advocacy toolkit about how to talk to your legislators too. You know, like always be kind and um, always, uh, you know, don't uh, um, inflate the facts, um, you know, give them the facts and, um, and use your, um, use your story to be persuasive, um, especially when there's a lot, you know, like this house about there, there's a lot of details in it. And, you know, sometimes if they don't, if legislators don't have the answers, they'll ask you, you know, for details on a bill. And you don't have to know all the details. Just um, tell them that you have heard that it's concerning and your story and how it may impact you or how, you know, those particular programs now are helping. And we don't want to, um, we don't, we, <laughs> that's our goal is to help people with programs. Um, so, always, always, always tell your story to your legislator. So thank you for sharing that, Todd. Any Carlin, other questions? Carlin, do you got a moment for me to just share something with the people yes. that are on? 
Um, so, uh, my name is Brady Worker. To all of you again, I'm the chair for the DB Council. I did want to share with everybody on today. Um, uh, in April, uh, the council is looking at possibly sending some representatives from the Iowa DD Council to uh, the Disability Policy Seminar in Washington, D.C. Um, it was scheduled according to my email in March, but it looks like they're going to push it back due to some hotel issues. Um, but I did want to um, just kind of put the bug out there to everybody that's on here today. Um, I would love for any one of you to reach out to me either through email or um, you can get my contact information from the DD Council. But I, if I end up going to the seminar, I want to hear from you guys what our council can take to DC to advocate for. Um, I, I want you guys to have a voice in this as well, not just having it come from the council, but I would I would love to have your guys' voice as well. So uh, we have a couple months until we hope that they schedule this. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me or anybody on the council, but I would love to partner and work with you guys so we can get this advocacy to the federal level to advocate more for people with uh, disabilities. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you, Brady, for offering that and, and reiterating that we all want to hear from you um, about priorities and, um, you know, again, questions or concerns that you have. That's, that's what we're here for. So um, all yep. of our contact information is on our website and, um, and Brady too, and we can um, get questions or comments to Brady too, to take to the federal level. So Thank you for looks that. Like, looks like Aaron has a question. Aaron. Aaron, did you want to take yourself off mute? All right. Um, not really a question, but a comment. Um, I just like to say that with everything everything that's going on with the Capitol, um, my my favorite show is called Monk, um, and there's a statement called um, "Use your inner monk," and that means that um, that means he is the like. He knows every single detail in in every single crime, like um, with the capital and everything. You need to do the same thing. <laughs> I love that. What a perfect way to end our our session today, Aaron. Thank you for sharing that. So, everybody, use your inner monk this <laughs> week. Get in, know the details of some of this legislation and what you can do. Thank yeah. you, Erin, for sharing that. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks for Thanks, joining guys. us.